What's up, Trek Nation? Welcome back to After the Snap. It's me, Tasha Pierce. I'm here to talk to you today about Star Trek Strange New World Season 2, Episode 3, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. In this one, La'an travels back in time to the 21st century Earth to prevent an attack which will alter humanity's future history and bring her face to face with her own contentious legacy. This one was written by David Reed and directed by Amanda Rowe. It has a star date of 1581.2. Now let's just start off with a full disclosure. This is not my favorite episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, but it did grow on me the second time I watched it. It seems like this is their version of the city on the edge of forever, and I like that. I also like the fact that they didn't go the typical route of having the captain be at the center of the story. Now that we know that there is a real world uh, reason for this, Anson Mount being out of production while his wife was giving birth to their child. We also, we just got an opportunity to explore the character of La'an and to get to know her a bit better. We also got a look at the mundanity of life as the security chief on the Enterprise. We got a montage of scenes that show various security beefs that have happened on the Enterprise, ending with Pelia. And Pelia's collection of items that she borrowed throughout history made me wonder exactly how the hell old is she? <laughs> uh, she also, in her, mon- in her part of the montage, dropped some clues that proved to be useful later on in the episode. Now, Mbenga also got to show off his sparring skills again with La'an while she worked off some aggression. Then all of a sudden, a dude in a gray suit appeared on the Enterprise, dying. He had been shot with an actual bullet. He handed La'an an apparatus and told her to get to the bridge. So La'an does just that. She heads straight to the bridge. And instead of finding Pike and the crew she expected, she finds Kirk and she learns that he is the captain of this enterprise. So after they establish he ain't Pike and this ain't Starfleet, they tussle over that device that old boy gave her and they wind up in 21st century New York. I mean, Toronto, which is kind of a joke in itself because there have been many other cities portrayed and they call it New York and it's really somewhere else. This time, Kirk thought it was New York it really was Toronto, which is the city that they filmed Strange New Worlds in. So I enjoyed that this version of Kirk was much different than the prime timeline one. Uh, the difference in his history would shape him into an entirely different man. We also see that he shares some similarities with that Kirk, uh, such as always thinking ahead, uh, being a strategist. So we saw the similarities. We saw the differences. I thought that was very well played. I grew a little tired of the scenes at the store and the chess hustling, but they had to show us how La'an and Kirk would survive though, so I guess. We also got the obligatory shirtless Kirk scene and thank you. Didn't know I needed that in 2023, but thank you. Um, I don't know how much money Kirk won though, because we saw them eat and stay at a very nice hotel. Uh, They would need gas for the hog they eventually carjacked as well, but those are nitpicks and y'all know i nitpick those are some of my nitpicks but before we get to carjacking and all that stuff they wake up in the hotel and right outside the window they watch as a bridge explodes in a terrorist act get to the bridge takes on an entirely new meaning Uh, so they realize that this was supposed to happen in both of their realities but the use of a photon weapon which hadn't been developed on earth yet uh, leads them to conclude that aliens did it Now, this is where they steal the most conspicuous car they could find. And uh, Kirk easily figures out how to drive it. He is a starship captain. He's used to far more complicated machinery than this. And then they chase a van carrying the rubble to an unknown destination. So carrying the rubble from this bridge to an unknown destination. Now, La'an learns Kirk has no idea about the history of her surname and She's able to let her guard down around him. For the first time in her life, she doesn't feel judged. So they meet a chick named Sarah. First, when they were looking at the wreckage from the bridge, and then again, when she came to their assistance when the police were detaining Kirk, because he drives like a maniac. (laughs) 
she came across like a ufologist or something like that with some very clear photos of a UAP, which turns out is a Romulan bird of prey. Sarah also mentions a cold fusion reactor, which would be where Kirk and La'an's timelines kind of branch. In Kirk's reality, that reactor would be destroyed by the Romulans and Toronto would be no more. Now, I wonder why Kirk isn't in more of a hurry to get the F out of the past if he knew that they were days away from being annihilated. It's just something that I'm nitpicking, I guess. Is this another nitpick? Now, just to speed things along in this recap, they needed a way to track down this reactor. So they wanted an engineer who could build a tricorder. That would make things an awful lot easier for them. That's when La'an remembered Pelia's little hint that at this point in history, she had a spot in Vermont. So they drove at least seven hours, did some sleuthing, and found Pelia. After convincing her to let them in her shop, called the archaeology department, they asked for help. Except this Pelia ain't a damn engineer. She's a retail worker. <laughs> in fact, she probably got the idea to become an engineer from them. <laughs> they figure something out, though. Divers' watches have a small amount of phosphor, which will glow when in proximity to tritium, which is a byproduct of cold fusion. So thanks, Pelia. We'll take one diver watch. Now, after a little lovey-dovey between Kirk and La'an, as they walk through the streets of Toronto, the hands on the watch start to glow. So they enter a building, and they later discover this is the Noonien Singh Institute for Cultural Achievement. La'an's biometrics are able to bypass a security scanner, which is why she was important. She was the person for this mission. Just when it appears that our heroes are going to enter this building and save the day, here comes Sarah ass. Now, she has been on Earth for 30 years, and she is tired. She recognizes Kirk, and then Kirk figures out she's a freaking Romulan. Now, she needs in that building, and she's holding them at gunpoint. But Kirk thinks she won't shoot because if she shoots, it'll alert security. But Kirk thought wrong because she hits him center mass. And she's just happy to say that she is the person who killed the famous Kirk. Then she grabs La'an, forces her through the corridors, and starts dropping anyone who crosses their path. She knows she can't get to the reactor now, but she can enact plan B. You know how people say if they can go back in time, they'd kill baby Hitler. But then other people say, well, if you kill baby Hitler... Just somebody else will come into power instead of Hitler and the history will still progress in the same manner. Sarah didn't get that memo because she's coming to kill Khan, who was housed here at this institute, because she is 100 percent certain that if he never comes to power, humans will never become enlightened and the Federation will never form. She will have erased Romulus's greatest enemy. So Laan fights for her ancestor. Even though this is the one who makes her ashamed of her name, she fights. They are right outside his door, which Sarah manages to force La'an to open. So in their struggle, Sarah loses possession of that weapon. La'an retrieves it and pew, pew, pow, pow. In that moment, the time travel device lights green, indicating that the timeline was safe. It was fixed. La'an could go home. But first, she has to see Khan. And when she enters the room, she finds a scared little boy. She puts down the weapon and consoles him, telling him he's right where he needs to be. Then she steps outside of the room. She pushes the button, finds herself back on the Enterprise. But she had to be sure. So she went to the bridge. And on the bridge, you see Pike and Una, and they are counseling Pelia about all this shit that she stole. So everything is right where she left it, except for she got on different clothes. And Pike recognizes that her entire outfit is different. So her whole uniform is still on 21st century Earth in the trash can, along with Kirk's and Kirk's body. Which leads me to believe, you know, I had to come in here with some speculation nation. Which leads me to believe that that body that we see at Daystrom Institute is not Kirk from here. It's Kirk from there. I could be wrong. It is a stretch. 
But I'm just throwing that out there. There is a possibility that that could be his body that we see at Daystrom Station. Hmm. Another thing to consider is what if Khan became the tyrannical leader that he did become because he had that weapon in his room? Now, I don't know if this was just an oversight on production or what, but I, I really give them more credit than leaving that weapon in his room and not realizing that it was going to start these types of conversations. Khan now has access to a weapon at like 10 years old. So is that a predestination paradox? I don't know, but it sure seems like it could be that La'an set in motion the very thing that she resents about her name. So anywho, after leaving the bridge, La'an goes to her room and finds a freaking temporal agent sitting there waiting for her, Agent Emily, with the weirdest spelling of Emily that I think I've ever seen in my life. But hey, future. But it, okay, so Agent Emily is like, give me that device. Thank you very much. You did what you had to do. You can't mention this to anybody. Made myself clear. You don't know who we are because we don't exist yet, but I came back here to get all of our shit. Give me our shit. See you later. So now Emily's gone. La'an sits on her bed and gets on her pad and dials up Lieutenant Kirk of the USS Farragut. And she just really wanted to see his face. They have a brief conversation. He thinks that she's calling uh, regarding his brother, Sam. He actually invites her out for drinks if she's ever on the same space station with him. And because that's what Kirk does, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and they cut the conversation short. It was a very short conversation, but she just needed to see his face. And when she saw his face, she cried. And when she cried, I cried. And you know what? Talking about this episode has made me like it an awful lot more. Not saying still that it's one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, but after talking it out, watching it a second time, I really did like this episode. I didn't, didn't hate it. I didn't dislike it as much as I did the first time I watched it, I guess what I'm saying. So I was initially going to give this one a three. I think this talk that we've had here has bumped that up to a 3.75. But I'd like to know what you would rate this episode. Yes, that's right. I'm making it a thing. What would you rate tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow on a scale from one to five? Don't be coming in here with no A's and B's and 10s and 12s. One to five. <laughs> Put it down in the comments while you're there. Hit the like button. Subscribe to my channel if you've not yet done so. Turn on your notifications so you will not miss Engage Live, our weekly live stream that happens on Sundays at 4.30 p.m. Central, where we talk about all things Trek and really dig deep into these Strange New Worlds episodes. I got some people who like me. I'm going to show their names right now. They're, they're going to be here. Thank you guys for, for being my, my uh, support system. And with all that being said, I will see you in the next review. Live long and prosper. Peace.